And before we read, let's say a short prayer. Lord our God, well, this is your word and we pray that you would apply it to us today. That uh, the words that are spoken from your pulpit would be the words that we need to hear to, to grow, to improve in our lives, but also, Lord, to understand your grace and mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting at verse 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, and the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And we'll stop there. So this is Hannah. And uh, she, has, she has a situation that, that's worth paying attention to here for a moment. Hannah is financially secure and loved, but she's barren. She has no kids. She seems unable to have kids at all. But it sounds like she comes from some, an affluent family, that she doesn't have to worry about where her food is coming from or anything like that. She gets a double portion when she sacrifices. Um, and she's well loved by her husband, but she has no kids. Now, th- that she is in a family with two wives, that shows that she's a person, she's somebody of means. Um, So she's wealthy in the material sense of the word, um, but her soul is deeply troubled. 
Now, infertility is, is tragic for anybody at any time, but um, it was especially tragic back then. Because barrenness is especially tragic when family is primary and survival is paramount. When you are constantly wondering if you are going to survive, um, having kids is a very high priority because you will depend on your kids in old age because there's no social security. You'll depend on having lots of kids to, to defend yourself if you are attacked or your clan is attacked um, and more people to work on the, in the fields. Having lots of kids means survival. Having no kids means you are not going to survive. So this is why men like Elkanah would have multiple wives because then you can double the amount of kids that you can have. It's, it's not about, it's not about uh, personal gratification or anything like that. This is why Sarah would give her maidservant to Abraham. This is why Lot's daughters did what they did because having kids meant survival. So, and one other thing that makes uh, barrenness especially tragic back then is that God had promised his salvation through the seed of a woman. And so, having kids is kind of like your way of being a part of God's salvation. And without that, you kind of don't have a share in that. And your family will not be around when that salvation comes. So there's, there's, some, there's some more reasons why it's, it's tragic for them. So one thing that, to pay attention here is that we have needs for food and for clothing and for shelter and, and those basics like that. Um, but we have more needs than just the material needs. We have legitimate needs for things like honor and significance. And this is what, this is what was going on here. Hannah had plenty of food to eat. She wasn't worried about, about those material things, but, but she, was, she was derided. She had, no, she had no honor because she wasn't part of a unit that is going to contribute to the survival of the family and the clan. And that's shameful. And so we have needs, basic needs, for honor and significance. And there's nothing wrong with that. We... Being, being number one, that, that might be a matter of pride, but, but having just some basic honor and significance, no, we, we need that. In verse 11, Hannah actually used the word um, affliction there that can also be interpreted or, or translated as poverty. So she sees her plight as a plight of poverty, even though she's wealthy. And so, there's some things that money can't buy, right? There's things that money can't buy, and without them, we are in poverty. There's more than one kind of poverty. So, verses 5 and 6, it says there that the Lord had closed her womb. Almost like it was on purpose. Now, at this, at this point in the story, when you're at verses 5 and 6, you might think, wow, that sounds pretty cruel of God to do. Why would he do that to Hannah like this? Um, is God being mean to her? Well, as you go through the story, you start to understand that there's bigger things going on. It tends to be how it works with us too. At, at certain times in our lives, we might think, boy, God is being especially cruel to me. But as your story goes on, you can start to see that there's bigger things going on. And we don't have to be as discouraged as we are. We also have um, Penina, who provokes Hannah for being barren. Um, and here you can see the Bible consistently shows the problems of having multiple wives. I mean, it happens in Bible times, but there's lots of problems with it. The Bible is not like, hey, this is a, an ideal by any means. No, it's like if you go that route, if you go away from God's design, there's going to be problems. So, Peninnah provokes Hannah. Elkanah, her husband, in verse 8, I just am kind of amused by what he says. Hannah, why do you weep? 
And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? So Elkanah does not understand, obviously. Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? It's almost like he thinks quite highly of himself. But he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand what she's going through. So what we can see here is that Hannah's alone. Hannah has nobody else in her life that she can connect with or that can empathize with her. She's all alone. And uh, as, this, as the story is told, we're, we, we can empathize with her pretty easily, um, even if we're not in her situation, because there's nothing worse than being alone. It's, it's bad to have bad things happen to you, but it's much worse when there's nobody there to support you in any way. Being alone is the worst. And so we can empathize with her, at least in that way. So Hannah prays. She prays. And, and I'm sure this is not the first time that she prayed, but this time she makes a vow. And that vow is recorded as a prayer. And her prayer is quite simple. It's, it's not this big, this big uh, oration that's, that's amazing of any kind. She doesn't use high rhetoric. I mean, the prayer that comes in the next chapter is, is quite fancy, but this one is not. Hannah's prayer is simple. It's not long. It's not eloquent. It has a directness of style according to one person that I read, without ornament or conventional liturgical phrasing, and almost a naive simplicity is what one person described it as. And, and you can see that. It, she's, she's not being fancy. She's just being straightforward with God. So there's something we can take away, notice from that too. Our prayers don't have to be fancy. They just need to be sincere. I try to mention this um, in my Sunday school class, all the students take turns. Well, we, we don't take turns. I ask for a volunteer to pray at the end, and I try to say something like this. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be sincere. At the end of martial arts class, I ask for a volunteer to pray, and I say something like this. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be sincere. And, and that's very true, because prayer is something that any one of us can do. This is not rocket science. Little kids can do this. Okay? It's, it's quite simple. You just have to be sincere. It doesn't have to be fancy. Hannah wasn't being fancy here. There wasn't anything impressive about her words. But she prays for a son, and she makes a vow to give that son back to God if she has one. So this is what she's saying. Lord, I desperately want a son. If you would give me a son, I will give him back to you. And he will serve you all the days of his life. And then there's also this mention of no razor shall touch his head. Um, there, there's, some, there's something in the Bible about being a Nazarite and that you are, as a Nazarite, you are specially devoted to God. And one of those signs that you are specially devoted to God is that you will not cut your hair. Samson was one of those, for example. But that's what that is. She makes a vow to give him back to God. Give to me and I will give to you, she says. So, something to notice about her prayer here. Hannah's prayer is not for personal gain, but God's service. She's not here doing something like, Lord, give me a million dollars. That would be for personal gain. She's saying, Lord... I just want a son. If you would give me a son, I will give him to you. And he will be in your service. She's not thinking of herself. She's thinking of God. She's not just thinking of her own ends and interests. She's thinking of bigger ends and bigger interests. More important things. And so she devotes herself to that and her needs to that. 
And then it says, and then it talks about how the priest, Eli, he sees her over there and it sounds like she's doing this, but she's not speaking out loud. Um, She's moving her lips, but she's not using her voice. And so Eli misjudges her. Um, There was a brief mention of certain people, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, and uh, Later, if you read through 1 Samuel, you'll come to find out that these are particularly wicked sons of his. And uh, it says that they tend to sleep with lots of women. And so Eli, being accustomed to having certain kinds of women around, probably thought Hannah was one of them. And that's why he went in assuming the worst. But she's not. She prayed, moving her lips, but with no voice. God hears our prayers even when others don't. There's, that's what we can notice here. So Eli couldn't hear what she was saying. He thought, he thought she was drunk. And Hannah was actually praying. God heard her prayer. Eli couldn't hear it. But God did. So we need to, we need to pray knowing that God hears us. It doesn't matter if other people hear us or not. It matters is whether God hears us or not. And for that matter, um, Jesus taught us to pray in a way that doesn't attract attention. All right? In fact, in Matthew 6, he puts it quite strongly. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. They make a big show of it. You know, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. All right? He's saying, be be so private about your prayer that it's, you know, you're in in a closet somewhere. The, The houses back then, most of them didn't really have many rooms. That would basically refer to your closet, you know? Now, he's not saying that we have to do this all the time. Jesus prayed in public, and, and so did the apostles. So he's not, this is not an absolute rule, but what he's saying is that your prayer is not for show. This is not for other people to see or hear. You're praying to God who can hear you anywhere. And Hannah knew that, and she was living that out. God hears our prayers, even when other people don't. And what was fascinating in the story is that after giving her need to the Lord, Lord, my need for a son, I'm giving that to you. After that, she was no longer sad. God hadn't answered her prayer yet. But right afterwards, she was no longer sad. She got a good wish from Eli, and that's all she had. But she gave her need to God said so basically God this is my need this is what this is what my heart's desire is I'm going to give that to you and you do with it what you want so there's something noticeable here that Philippians talks about do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication that means requests With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And and I think this is exactly what, what happened with Hannah. She hadn't had her prayer answered yet. She didn't have a son yet. But suddenly, after praying and giving it over to God, suddenly she's okay. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us because she hadn't had an answer yet, but it surpasses all understanding. And she was at peace after that. There's something powerful about prayer where even if we don't get what we want, there's something that strengthens us by it. Sometimes in ways we're not even aware of. But here's, here's kind of what I hope we walk away with today. When we put our needs into God's purposes, we will see results. 
So if you're praying just for your own gain, just for your own advantage, you know, then that, that's kind of a selfish prayer. You, you probably won't get what you're asking for. God doesn't tend to cater to our selfish demands. You know, he's, he's a good father and he doesn't like to spoil us. All right? But when you take your needs and say, Lord, I want my needs to be incorporated into your plans, into your purposes, and to your kingdom, that's when we see stuff happen. And it might not be the results that we want. You know, prayer is not magic. That's not how God works. That's how Satan works. God works in ways that he loves us and he knows more than us. And so he's going to give us what is right and good and true. Whether we think it is what we need or not. But we will see results. We will see results. That, and that's, that's the thing that I hope that we see about prayer. Even if God doesn't answer us as we would want, hopefully we can still see that he is at work and he is answering us even in, in better ways than we had thought. And then she names her son Samuel. Samuel. And at the text note at the bottom there, it says, sounds like heard of God. That's what his name sounds like. So, what we can see here is that she was so delighted that God had answered her prayer that she names her kid after God hearing her prayer. That her, she gives her the entire name for her kid after God answering her prayer. Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever prayed in such a way that you were really desperate and you had God come through for you, it's, it's an amazing feeling. Um, I'm, I think one example that I can think of is um, I was supposed to teach um, at Calvin College for one January and my first semester there, I was terribly nervous. I felt like I was in over my head. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I prayed. And the entire time, I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was going to let these students in my class down. And I wasn't going to do them a, a service. And at the end, um, the student evaluations, I was in the top category of the student evaluations even. Now, I know that wasn't me. I know that God answered my prayers. And when I saw that, there was this, wow, God is, God is amazing. God will answer your prayers. And in that, that case, he answered them in ways that I wanted him to, or I hoped he would. When you have that, when you have that moment when you realize, boy, God answered my prayers, that's a wonderful feeling. So put, put your needs, your concerns into God's hands. Not for, not for your advantage. Like I, in, that, in this case, I wanted these kids to know Scripture more and to grow in it. And to know God more and grow in Him. And I saw that happen in the discussions and in the feedback that I got. But it's a delightful thing when you hear or you see, rather, God's answer to your prayer. So Hannah named her child after God's answer to prayer. Her son was a testament to God hearing and answering prayers. And when God answers our prayers, when God answers your prayers, shout it from the rooftops. Tell people about it. Hey, God, this God that I've always believed in, he's, he's real. And... The prayer that we give to him, he answers those. And I just saw it. I just saw it happen. I don't think this is coincidence. I think this is God answering my prayers. God is real. One thing that you can see if you read through the rest of the Bible, starting from here, is that Hannah's prayer went a lot farther than she even thought. Hannah's prayer triggered a series of events that culminate in David's reign and is fulfilled in Christ's reign. If you know the story of 1 Samuel, we're going through it in the, 
in the evenings, um, in our evening services, Samuel, it's interesting where Samuel starts. Samuel doesn't start with the anointing of King David. It doesn't start with the anointing of King Saul. Samuel starts with Hannah's prayer. And what that's saying to us is that this prayer triggered a series of events that ultimately led up to Christ's coming. Prayers have a way of shaping history in ways that we aren't even aware of. We don't know much about Hannah after this. We, I, who knows how much of it she, she saw in her lifetime or knew about. Maybe, maybe little or nothing. But that prayer started something that was amazing. Prayers have a way of shaping history. And you and I, you and I, we are a part of something that we would call God's grand plan of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And you and I being in Christ, the actions that we do that are in Christ are a part of God's salvation plan in this world. And that's what you can see here with Hannah. Hannah, you know, wasn't... Wasn't much to speak of on, on human terms, but boy, that prayer that she prayed, that triggered a series of events that ended up in David's reign and ultimately was fulfilled in Christ's reign. Look at that important role that she played. Our prayers have a way of shaping history in ways that we aren't even aware of. But what I want you to realize here is that Hannah here reflects Christ. The whole Old Testament points ahead to Jesus. All right? Hannah reflects Jesus who submitted his interests to the Father at Gethsemane. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he was arrested, he said, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this up from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So he had, he had something that he wanted. And he gave it to the Father. He said, please make this happen. And yet your will is greater than mine. When you and I, when we surrender our interests to God's purposes, we become so much more than somebody who just gets what they want. We become an echo of Christ who submitted his interests to the Father at Gethsemane. Hannah's life reflected Christ and points ahead to him. You and I, when we pray with God's interests in mind, not our own, not for personal gain, but for God's glory, God's kingdom, and the benefit of others, um, we are reflecting Christ. Jesus still went to the cross and he lost it all, but on the other side of it, he gained it all. And in that way, God did answer his prayers. So, final thought. Give your longings to the Lord and He will satisfy you. That's what we can see in Hannah. A couple verses to point to this. Look at this. He gives the barren woman a home, making her a joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. One more. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. And he will act. And let's respond to this question. Let's answer it together. What does your conclusion to this Lord's Prayer mean? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever means we have made all these requests of you because as our all-powerful king, you not only want to, but are able to give us all that is good. And because your holy name, and not we ourselves, should receive all the praise forever. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord God, our, our Heavenly Father, thank you for being a God who, who listens to us and answers us. 
And Lord, as we have reflected on Hannah's prayer today, Lord, please use her prayer to to shape our prayers, not for our gain and glory, but for yours. Uh, Lord, not so that we can be proud or arrogant, but so that you would be glorified. And that, Lord, when we see your answers to prayer, that our trust in you would only increase. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.